better get me back, as it'll be dark soon, and they mostly come at night. Mostly. Yo, mini M&Ms are the fuck, like, straight up, they taste better than normal M&Ms. There is a taste difference. I don't agree. You Sydney don't would agree. say the same thing, but I don't agree. Sydney is tuned into the truth. She's on the same frequency as objective reality, and you're over here in some parallel universe. Welcome Damn, to mini M&Ms now. <laughs> welcome to mostly horror. We're talking about mini M&Ms. Um, I'm Damn Steve. Right. That's Sean. We're back. Um, <laughs> we always say we're back, but we we don't leave. Yeah, uh, we but we're back still. Um, we're here. Another great episode. Um, yeah, you've heard of it's. I gotta say, I was really confused. Um, Sean and I were going through the history of the the Omen films, mm-hmm. and when you would reference the original one, you kept saying the first Omen. But this film is called the First Omen, and I was yeah. getting really fused, confused. And on that note, we we uh, have another great episode, obviously today. Um, the first omen, the second of two non exploitation films that we mm-hmm. have been treated to this early spring. Um, director Arkasha Stevenson, uh, producer and, and one of the screenwriters, Tim Smith, uh, are joining us on the episode today to chat about their new um, origin story prequel of the omen. Um, so very yep. excited about that. Chels, can we get a Rectus Monimus? You know what I'm talking about. Give yeah. me the South Park one, though. Give me the South Park Rectus. Rectus I don't know what that's what they say, but let's get some of those in there. You know. I know about it. Um, <laughs> before we jump into that interview, um, we normally hit some things that you probably already know, but I don't really have a lot of that today. What I do want to bring up <laughs> is I I texted Sean a couple days oh. ago. I actually need I, – I want to find – how this started for context um i texted you and uh (laughs) 905 in the morning yeah man (laughs) you said uh, we were talking about scheduling people for the podcast yeah business yeah business stuff i'm like all right sean blah 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 i think i have an idea for this week's episode you said right on in in the same text bubble, you go right on, and then you say, "Steve, about an hour ago, I straight up saw a ghost, and I'm still trying to process. <laughs> I'm still trying to process it. I'm not making things up. I wasn't dreaming, and it wasn't a, a trick of light." And then we got into the story. And so, what I would like uh... for you to do is to treat our listeners and watchers to the story of the ghost that you saw. You also followed up with some Snapchats, which were very helpful to illustrate what you were Context. talking about. And also Context. made me go. It, I, and I unfortunately watched the snaps after finding out Uh-oh. everything after the whole sure. story. But uh, I can completely see why you would have been freaked. So give, it's... give us a treat. And also, yes, uh, you only told me this through text, so I got to hear sure. you explain it. Yeah. Oh, my God, guys. Yeah, it's Sean so funny because, dude, when I texted you it, I was like, I was thinking in that moment, like, I should probably wait because this would be so much better fresh on the pod. But at the same time, I was like, no, dude, my entire grip on reality has just been shaken yet again. Yeah. Uh, and I just have you were the person that was conscious. Like yeah. you were the first <laughs> the first like living soul that reached out to me after the dead did. So yeah. I was just <laughs> desperate. <laughs> so I was just desperate to fucking yeah. share what I was in. And at that point, yeah, it was nine in the morning and the ghost encounter had happened um, around seven or so, seven thirty. Uh, I don't remember the exact time, but so okay, guys. To to set up the the scene, I am not in New York right now. I traveled uh, home to Michigan, took a flight to Michigan to visit some family. During this flight, um, my younger sisters are. Uh, one of them is on spring break from high school. My mother during my... the during the trip, not during the flight. Yeah, sorry, during the trip. Yeah. Yes, yep. yes. Uh, one of my younger sisters is on spring break and my mom was like, let's do a little something. We, we can't obviously can't go crazy. Only so much time, but let's go to like fucking Kalahari in Sandusky, mm-hmm. Ohio. The home Shout of out Tommy to Boy. Chelsea who yes, yesterday, uh, in trying to find the name of it, called it Calamari. And Calamari. So shout out to Chelsea. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for those who do not know, um, 
Kalahari is just a big hotel water park, uh, mm-hmm. a big hotel with a, a water park inside. They have a bunch of other things, but it's like a like a it's like a hot vacation spot for people in Michigan. <laughs> it's, yep. if, if you're from yep. Michigan, your family goes to Cedar Point, the Great Wolf mm-hmm. Lodge, Kalahari, and Florida. That is what yes. you do, and the UP, um, and the UP. which is also yeah, just right, Michigan, yeah. but up. Yep. Um, but yeah, so. <laughs> So we decided to do that and we go to this hotel and, um, and yeah, uh, had a great time, but we're, oh, it's, so it's me, my mother, my two sisters, my two younger sisters, and then one of their boyfriends, uh, one of my, mm-hmm. my older younger sister has recently started to date. That's a whole story in itself. That's a whole other thing. Very mostly it's, horror. It's a lot to get used to. I'll tell you that. Um, I but bet. her, her boyfriend had joined us. Nice guy. Um, the way our hotel is set up is there's you walk in, there's like a living room space with like a couch with a pullout bed. And then there mm. are two separate bedrooms uh, that like closed doors, whatever. I was the person that took the couch pullout bed. So I'm in the biggest part of the hotel room alone and everyone else is in these other rooms with the doors closed. Uh, fell asleep. Everything was fine. Totally normal. Not a big deal. I wake up at like seven something in the morning and i'm hearing a noise also i fell asleep with the tv on i wake up and i'm hearing a noise the tv is no longer on and i just hear like someone messing with it sounds almost like a clicking uh and i'm like what is going on and i i like i'm processing it for a second and then i as i wake up more i'm like okay so that's clearly coming from over there and i lean forward because i couldn't i wish i could show all of you listeners right now the same snaps that i sent to steve but (laughs) It's I the clicking is coming from like like if I'm laying on the bed, it's coming from above my head and like not like floating above me, but like over to the right. Like it's not in a direction that I can see. And so I have to turn like sit up and like kind of turn my body and peek around this like wall where this table is and sitting at the table in the dark. But there's light enough coming in from outside that, you know, it's not like pitch black, but sitting in the dark is a massive figure sitting uh, just sitting at this table with its head kind of down it wasn't doing anything i couldn't see a face but i saw this like big figure sitting at the table and it, i wasn't creeped out that is not the scary part i instantly was like oh like like my sister's boyfriend is awake and doing something at the table and i was like maybe he just can't sleep i was like i don't really want to acknowledge him too much because i would like to go back to sleep i don't want to have a yeah. conversation i don't want to feel obligated to be awake I was like, I'm going to go back to sleep, but I'm hearing this clicking and I'm like, what is it's, it's like seven in the morning. What is he doing? Why is he just sitting there? That's kind of weird. And like 30 seconds, a minute, a minute and a half at most later, I am thinking to myself, I don't really know this guy. I'm going to be honest. He's really nice, but I'm like, I don't really know this guy. I'm hearing clicking. I'm like, dude, did he, like, is he, like, loading up a gun? Are we all about to get fucking mass? Like, that's my brain. That's my brain. <laughs> oh my dude, straight up. I didn't even tell you that part. Oh but I was just, like, God. I was just, like, nefarious. I was, like, what is this person that I just met? Like, I literally met him in the car on the way to, you know, the hotel. Yeah. I don't think that's what nefarious means. But I, I No? Did I use no, the word that's, wrong? That's fine. What is nefarious? <laughs> All right, we'll come back to it. <laughs> Misdeeds then. Um, but I I am I need to know more about what's going on. So I lean forward again and I'm gonna say something to him. And again, note, this is only a minute, a minute thirty, I think it was more like forty five seconds after the initial setup. Yeah, can I, I ask really yeah, quick do before it. you go further? Oh my god. If he was loading a gun what were you planning on saying to him it don't (laughs) (laughs) don't do it (laughs) no um yeah please don't do that that's a bad idea uh i don't endorse this plan um but no i just needed to know like if my fate was coming i need dude if death is coming for me i'm looking him right in the fucking want to be awake yeah i can't like don't sneak up behind me um yeah but so So I turn and I look, and it's mainly, it's not that I think that that's what he's doing. It's more that like, oh, I'm no longer comfortable enough to just go back to sleep. I have to understand what's happening right now. Because again, there's no TV. It is this person that I don't really know sitting in the dark, only about 
five feet away from my bed. Um, so I, I turn and I look again, and there is no one sitting at that table. Nobody. And that is the moment where I went, hold up. What did I just see? Because again, the it was basically a silhouette. I, it wasn't just like a shadow figure. Because I've seen, yeah. I've, dude, I've had, I've talked about it before on the pod. I've had sleep deprivation stuff where I was seeing kind of like shadow figures yeah. around. But I attribute that to like sleep deprived hallucinations. And yeah. they were, they were more amorphic. Is that mm-hmm. the right word? Amorphous. Yeah. Am, am, yeah. Amorphous. There you go. <laughs> words. Words. Uh, but this was clearly like a silhouetted person. Mm-hmm. And honestly, especially from like the angle I was at, it looked even bigger than him. But I just, mm-hmm. when I first saw it, I immediately assumed it was him. And then when it was gone, I was like, wait. And so I'm sitting, I, dude, I literally, I'm like this. And I'm just, you guys can't see it. I'll have to make a clip. But I'm just like staring in the dark, trying to process the fact that no one's there. And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, I lean over a bit more. I'm looking around the whole place now. Nobody is there. And fear starts to build up in me, and I'm trying to make sense of it. And I want to stress in this moment, and the reason that I started the text the way that I did to you was that I was like, that was not a dream. I was yeah. awake. Like I, I, that was the most important thing to me because I was like, I, I was knew that something happening upon waking makes it really easy for people to just write it off. And I'm like, I totally get yeah. that. I have weird transition from wake to sleep and sleep to wake. I knew for a fact that I was awake and that I actually saw this person standing there, that it wasn't a trick of light, that it wasn't just a shadow cast and that I wasn't dreaming. Um, But so I'm kind of like frozen in fear for a minute as this like reality sort of sets in that something was there and either is gone or I could only see it for a moment, but it's still there. And I'm like just in shock because I'm not, you know, I'm I'm open minded to shit, but I don't really believe in in ghosts anymore. As much as I love the idea, and as much as I used to, uh, I need a direct confrontation like this to sort of change that. And I've been asking for it. And I was like, "Did the universe just answer me?" So I stand up and I walk like I turn on one of the lights immediately, and I fucking like walk to the other end of the room. I check like the door to the hotel. Like I make sure that that's closed. I make sure he's not in the bathroom. I look at the two bedroom doors and they're both closed. Again, I have to remind it was only a minute and a half at most between these two things. I, he's not like a small guy. I would have heard him push the chair to stand up. I would have heard the door open. I certainly would have heard it close. It's right. It's not like it was far away from me. So for him to silently disappear just didn't make sense. And I also didn't hear him like shuffling around in the room. Like, so in my head, I'm like, it wasn't him. It was something else. And, uh, and yeah, dude, I, I had to turn the TV back on. And that also made me go like, wait, how did the TV get turned off? Like, why is the remote yeah. not on the bed, but it's on the counter next to me? Like, I was so confused by so many things. Dude, I started taking pictures with the flash on of the room, trying to catch something. Looking for orbs? Straight, well, not not orbs. An orb only means it would have to mean. be an impressive yeah. orb. But yeah. looking for fucking anything, dude. Yeah. I was taking pictures in mirrors. Dude, I was like, straight up, I was like, like, I was taking pictures looking at my camera. And then I was like, well, wait, maybe I'm not supposed to look. And then I like, so like, dude, I have pictures on my phone of like me to investigate, like full paranormal investigator mode. And, oh. uh, and yeah. And eventually I was like, there's no way I'm going to be able to go back to sleep. So again, that's like seven 30, maybe even a yeah. little bit earlier, maybe a little after I, do, I can't exactly place it, but I texted, uh, you know, my girlfriend at the time and she wasn't awake yet. And then she woke up and I had talked with her a little bit about it. She's like, what the fuck? And then I texted you and you're like, holy shit. Um, <laughs> and, you know, trying to make sense of it. And you're like, you know, trying to help me like yeah. debunk it. And I'm like, dude, I already did this. I swear to God. Like, I don't... <laughs> and I'm like, in my head, I'm like, the, the only answer is that is either that I had a full blown, like not dream hallucination, in which place I need to go to the doctor or he somehow it was him and he silently moved and i was like but the only way i can find that out is asking him but i didn't i don't trust my family not to fuck with me so i knew that i couldn't just ask them about it uh so i was i was sitting there trying to come up with a plan of how to how to ask 
in a way that wouldn't give them the opportunity like the, they wouldn't know what i was asking really but yeah, it, they yeah. would just answer if they had been up how'd everybody sleep <laughs> dude straight up like did anybody get up i thought i might have heard somebody yeah. you know like like i was trying to figure it out eventually i i calmed down enough that i was like listen man if a ghost is gonna watch me sleep it doesn't matter as long as i don't wake up to him watching me sleep i was like it's already yeah. seven people will probably be up in a few hours i was like if i as long as i wake up and other people are awake it's fine if something was watching me sleep and i didn't know it is what it is yeah i wake up my family is awake they're sitting at the table they don't know i'm awake you know they're trying to fairly be quiet because they're in my bedroom sleeping quarters at this point yeah. and i hear him just mention like oh yeah like i you know i came out here to to get something from my bag and like drink some of my drink and sean woke up and like looked at me really quick and went back to bed. And when I heard that, it debunked the entire situation. I love that. Uh, but but dude, <laughs> I just imagine them all talking, and then they think you're asleep, and you they just hear it was you. Yeah, dude. It's, it's like... <laughs> well, no, I, it's, it's funny because I wanted to say something right then, but I just yeah. I I my heart like yeah you went oh, yeah God. like awareness <laughs> came and I was like okay, <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, dude, it was for for about two hours. Uh, the other morning I had my reality shaken. I, and I was thinking yeah. to myself, like, dude, I have, I'm already so deep in alien bullshit. I do not need ghosts yeah. right now. I just don't need ghosts. So that was my wow. day guys. Uh, that's great for two yeah. hours, uh, a couple days ago, uh, ghosts were real and that's yep. all that matters is, Straight up. you know, they have their moment. Um, <laughs> I love that. I hoped all of our listeners loved that. Uh, I told Chelsea, I was going to have you tell it on the podcast. So Chelsea, I hope you <laughs> love that as well. We have a great conversation today with Arkasha Stevenson and Tim Smith really love their perspective on the first omen um, and what they were able to accomplish with this film. Any final thoughts before we get over to that conversation? Something I'm just reeling right now, realizing right now is that it, he might not have even been a ghost. He might've been a fucking omen. I didn't even consider that option before dark shadowy figure. It might as well have been yeah. a dog or a Raven sitting there staring at me. Um, yeah, guys, it, this conversation is so great. I think we get so much insight into into obviously the first omen as a film, but also you can really see their care in in all the important themes that this movie touches on and the care that they took in creating a, a new chapter, a prequel chapter, some new origin lore to this deeply loved franchise. Uh, it's a great conversation. And if you're an omen fan, I think you're you're really gonna dig it. Yep. Uh, on that note, we will get you guys over to our conversation with Akasha Stevenson and Tim Smith, director and writer and producers of The First Omen. Uh, hang around after that for our Mostly Horror Recommendations of the Week. All right, we are joined today by Arkasha Stevenson and Tim Smith. Arkasha is the director of the new 20th Century Studios film The First Omen, her feature directorial debut. Tim is one of the writers and producers on the same film, previously co-executive producing season three of Channel Zero, which Arkasha was a director of. Guys, thank you so much for being a part of the show today. Yeah, Thanks thank so you. Much for having us. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're so stoked to have you. We're very excited. Uh, I mentioned this before we started um you know, the episode, but Sean and I have seen the first omen, really excited to jump into it. Before we touch on any omen things, though, maybe we will, but before we we really dive into them, a question that we love to start off with, and, and whoever wants to take this one first, feel free. We want to know your intros to the horror genre, that first memory, not maybe just like the first movie you saw in a theater, but that first memory, the book you opened and there was a picture that was too scary or you know, an older sibling showed you a film that you probably shouldn't have been watching at that age. Do you guys have any memories like that that you would like to share with us today? Yes. Oh. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, I, I was raised on horror films from a very, very early age and it all started when I was five or six, I convinced my uncle that we were allowed to see R-rated films and we watched The Lost Boys. Ah, and that was uh, that was kind of like the gateway drug into horror. And I think my dad came home, was initially disappointed, and then was like, great, we'll just run with it. And uh, ever since then, it was it was all horror all the time. I always say that I was wearing like pinhead masks and Freddy Krueger hands and dressed up as Dracula in preschool and got 
uh, parents calling my parents. Um, <laughs> yes, that was that was kind of the beginning of it. I'll always remember Kiefer Sutherland as a vampire. It's yeah. like first recognition of like, okay, I love horror films. And like I said, that was way, way, way too early. Yeah. yeah. Freddy Krueger mask yeah. still happens on date night. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a good test. Yeah. 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 Perfect. Arkasha, what about you? Yeah, well, it, mine's a bit weird. And actually, I didn't even realize that this is it until my mom just came into town to see the film with us. Um, and we were talking to her about like, okay, what was the first thing that really scared the hell out of me? And uh, strangely enough, she took me to see Braveheart when it was in theaters. And me being, I don't know, I was like four or something. I was like, a Care Bear movie. Yes. You know, <laughs> and... <laughs> No. <laughs> spoiler alert it's not a care bear movie kid. No. yeah <laughs> um, but it scared the hell out of me and i just had never i mean i never you don't as a kid you just don't imagine that adults are that violent with each other yeah um, yeah. yeah and so i think that was that was the beginning of a, a wonderful relationship with therapists and yeah <laughs> yes yeah that, it was so, was there a oh i'm so sorry steve was there was a particular Go ahead, scene, Sean. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just curious if there was like a specific image or scene or like like kill or anything from it that stuck with you. I think of like Kali Ma from Indiana Jones and how much that messed with me and stuff like that. Uh, oh, yeah, I mean, it, this is sorry, this is such a downer. But um, when <laughs> when Mel Gibson's love interest is is tied to a pole and her neck is slashed because yeah. the her rape was intervened. Yeah. You know, by Mel Gibson. Um gee, like like it doesn't get darker than that. You yeah. Know? No. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's pretty, yeah, that's pretty some gruesome stuff. Um, but yeah, I just I didn't even understand the concept of rape. I didn't understand um, you know, politically and historically what was going on in these images that I, I was seeing. I just saw like this young, beautiful woman um have yeah, this happened to her and, and uh, yeah, just really stuck with me for a very long time. Of course. Sean and I talk about that a lot where it's like the first intro to that sort of thing sometimes isn't horror itself, but it's just those images. Like I, yeah, yeah I mean, when I think of Braveheart, I'm thinking like there's stabbings, people getting hit with maces, hung beheadings. Like it's just all of that great stuff that is not related <laughs> to Care Bears at all. So that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's such an interesting juxtaposition of the Care Bears. It's a strange body horror movie, you know. Honestly, you think about it as body horror, but it definitely is. Yeah. So. Yeah, one hundred percent. And Tim, you uh, so when it sounds like you didn't have, there was no scarring. You just it, you fully embraced from the beginning. Uh, yeah. It's scarring. Not <laughs> yeah, it's funny because we always talk about how the the omen was kind of a turning point for me with horror. It's like once I started seeing the psychological horror films, the ones that mm. felt a bit more grounded, like they could. The horror could exist in our everyday world. Sure. That's when I started to get really kind of unsettled. And like that evolved into like Michael Hanukkah movies and stuff like that, where it yeah. gets like really grisly and dark, where you can call it a horror film, but it's certainly an unconventional type of horror. But those are the movies like The Vanishing, you know, that really got under my skin where it's just, it's a little too real. And the omen yeah. caused me to pivot and get into those types of films. But yeah, the early stuff, you know, I was, um, I loved, even though it was scary. Like I just thought it was a thrill ride. Just embracing it. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, well, speaking of the omen, we obviously have to jump into this. I'm so curious. We're we're living in a world, you know, an era of remakes, prequels, spin-offs, reimaginings. Um, you know, the omen is this beloved classic franchise with one of the most iconic characters in the entire genre. So I'm just wondering if you guys could walk us through kind of the seeds of this project and and your guys' attachment with it and with 20th century and and just kind of talk about how this movie came to be yeah yeah there was absolutely no pressure at all and it was a complete breeze <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, there's, the pre the word prequel and sequel has so much dirty baggage that comes along with it you know absolutely. And yeah. i think you never want to cash in on people's nostalgia and their childhood memories in a way that isn't thoughtful um, so, so I think we were really excited to be part of this project, but also really terrified because we knew that we were, you know, we were tiptoeing into some really sacred territory, not just um, for other horror fans, but also for us, like these are the omens part of our childhood memories as well, you know? So um, I think 
what was really exciting was about the prospect of giving the realist, getting the real estate to try and make a film that could stand on its own two feet and and also have a dialogue with the original 76. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's funny, too. You know, they just announced they're doing a remake of Night of the Hunter. Yeah, which is yeah. Like a couple of days ago. Yeah, it's my one of my favorite movies. And it was such a bizarre reminder of what I felt when they first approached us. Because my initial impulse was like, no, don't touch it. Don't touch it. And like, that's the way I feel with all these films. It's like, do not touch it. It's a sacred horror film. And I think like Kasha said, when we first opened the script and saw it started with this novitiate named Margaret, and we realized it's kind of a different point of view. It dovetails with the original, but allows us to do our own thing. That's what got us really excited because there's no use in trying to replicate what worked in the omen. Like you can't, you can't approximate what's in that movie. I sure. think the only way to kind of do justice to doing a, a movie like this is to kind of carve your own path while still existing in that world. So that was really the goal, because if we set ourselves up to try to to best or equal the omen, I think that's just not the right way to approach it. Also, we just can't do that. It's yeah, such a <laughs> well, I just it's an impossibility. That. So it's fine. Yeah, yeah I'm. I'm curious with that mindset. So talking about prequel and sequel as a, as a dirty word. Um, I, yeah, I completely understand um, why some people feel that way. I am curious though, using night as a night of, um, sorry, night of the hunter and even um, the Omen films as an example, those are films that were made decades ago. Now at this point, specifically night of the hunter, you probably can't even watch it unless you have the criterion version. Like, do you feel like, what you guys are doing with the prequel film or, or when these films are remade is almost doing a service to try to bring a newer audience to those old movies when they may not have had, you know, interacted with them in the first place. Yeah. That's what's so surreal. It kind of almost reminds me of like star Wars in a way where it's like, you get to kind of make a prequel that strangely enough gets people into a film from 1976. So it's like, you're watching a film that was released so long ago as a yeah. follow up to this current release. So I totally yeah. think we, we always said if we do our jobs, if when people watch this film, they're going to be excited to check out a film from the 70s, which is so exciting. It's such a seminal, you know, classic for anybody who doesn't know about it. So, yeah, I, I definitely think that's that's the positive of doing something like this, that you can kind of reinvigorate interest in a, in a horror classic that some people might not be familiar with. Yeah. And I also, I also think, you know, nowadays it's and this is both really, um, I think, comforting and also really depressing is that I think culturally and politically and thematically the oh, the original omen is um is the same as as the first omen you know i think that all of these themes are still really culturally relevant like you know the omen was made in the wake of watergate and um during the vietnam war and there's this insane mistrust of authority and tradition in the 70s, you know, these movies like Rosemary's Baby and The Exorcist and The Omen are made in the wake of the counterculture and, and people are scared of their kids and they're scared of their, you know, tradition changing. And I think now we're experiencing the pendulum swing of that. Mm -hmm. And um, and so it it is kind of a perfect time to try and speak back to to what the horror films in the 70s were saying. A hundred percent. I love the pendulum swing like analogy that you have for that, uh, which perfectly leads me into some stuff where this episode isn't going to come out until, you know, after the movie. So as comfortable as you guys are with spoilers, we're down to really break stuff down. Um, you guys, you know, with you, you definitely created your own thing, like you said, that that exists in this world. But you're you're making this this prequel movie that is really looking more into the the origins of Damien and the the church and these these extremists that brought him to be and you guys kind of in i i'm not an absolute omen expert um but it seems like you guys kind of changed the narrative a little bit you're you're focusing it seems to me a bit more like criticizing some religious extremism that isn't just like satanism is bad um it, it seems like there is some uh talks about the the church and things like that so i'm just curious about your guys's thoughts on kind of adjusting the lore a little bit and uh and playing around with that stuff yeah can i can i answer that with like a roundabout story of please do okay. please <laughs> yeah my favorite type of story <laughs> yeah well we were um i don't think we weren't hired yet i don't know not at all yeah and yeah. but we were like okay if we're, we're going to you know throw our hat in the ring for this project let's go to rome and do some research um neither of us had been to rome before 
and um, we landed and it was raining and, and we we're kind of like, oh man, what the hell did we just do? We just spent a bunch of money and we might not even get this job. Did we do the right thing? And uh, we were walking down the street and there's just, you know, this giant banner that said Satan and Inferno. And we were like, oh God, <laughs> this is, this is a sign from God. And um, <laughs> turns out we landed uh, during the 750th anniversary of Dante Aguilari's death. And wow. so were all these art exhibits that were dedicated to, um, to uh, his, you know, the, the topography of hell and the depiction of hell and this one um, art exhibit um, it, it was beautiful. It had, you know, Bosch tableaus, it had Rodin sculptures and, and all these other paintings with like, you know, demons just tearing apart humans in these horribly grotesque ways. And then the second story was dedicated to art that was um, created by Holocaust survivors. Um, and the one-to-one -one parallels were so eerie and terrifying um, that it it made us think, you know, like, oh, this this is a movie about how humans bring hell to earth, mm -hmm. and it really, it doesn't have to do with Satan and the devil at all. It's really because you know he's really just a tool that people use, and so that was that really informed kind of I think our our ethos about this project and about the church and um and about how we wanted to incorporate the supernatural elements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I also just think just from a kind of a storytelling perspective, like Kasha said, we we wanted to deal one of the big themes of the film is, you know, institutions in power, how they respond when that power is threatened. And I just think it's so much more interesting to deal with the church facing the threat of secularism, which was really going on at the time. You know, we read like the Satanic Bible and it's it's talking about championing individualism and and you know. Um, secular belief and all these different things. And you kind of get a sense of, of the threats the church was feeling in the seventies, which also I think kind of dovetails with what's going on right now. So mm -hmm. dealing with kind of human nature and how even something as holy as the church can turn to evil in an effort to save itself and cling to that power just felt so much more interesting than them just being, you're just run of the mill Satanist, you know, who Agreed. just yeah. easy yeah. to uh, dismiss as evil. You know, and in all these, you know, hell tableaus, there's always like women tied down and like demons ripping them apart with like pitchforks and stuff. And strangely enough, this is going to sound really psycho, but I got really obsessed with these. You know, these the Navy put out these videos in the like late 50s and early 60s about like how to give birth, and it's uh, you know, women getting like strapped down to beds and, and in just that getting voice, in, yeah, yeah <laughs> you know, I can picture it, yeah, <laughs> and uh. And, you know, it's just like, really, there's this one where, where this woman's just like, you know, forcibly restrained and, and cut open and they're ripping the baby out of her. And they cut to the woman just now passed out with this gas mask on her face. And the voiceover goes, and she's fine, not feeling it. <laughs> and I was just like, oh God, there's no. so like, I'm seeing these parallels in real life to these hell tableaus everywhere now. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah. Um, Wow. Sorry. So many things also gathering right. my thoughts. Um, no, no, it's perfect. I, this is, this is what we love. Um, yeah. You, I mean, obviously you guys bring, you, you were talking about bringing like new themes and a new perspective and that pendulum swinging and, and you guys obviously are bringing in, I think a very needed like woman's perspective uh, into this story. And we definitely want to explore that um, in a bit. I, I want to bring up the, uh, the church stuff again. It, you talked about, uh, basically just like human evil, like how we're the ones that kind of bring hell to earth and we use something like the devil. I would say like we use deities in general, um, you know, to justify doing all sorts of wrong things. It, you don't need to be worshiping the quote unquote bad guy to be doing the bad things. Um, and that just goes to the, the institutions of power and everything. I just wanted to say like, I really loved what this movie did and flipping things on the head. Um, and, and also just from a narrative and like entertainment standpoint, I just don't think audiences are at, like we're not a, afraid of Satan the way that older generations were and, and we don't have the religious convictions. So if anything, we're more nervous about the the religious institutions of power. So in every way, it was just the most powerful. Like you guys just made all the right decisions. Um, yeah, so this is not really a question. I wanted to just further that and, and compliment you for it. I think you nailed it. <laughs> okay, we'll take that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you say thank you. I um yeah. 
like like Sean mentioned, you know, I think uh, I kind of want to go now to to Margaret as as a central character. So you you said that you guys came on after the script was at least a, a draft was written and there was kind of like a a concept in place. Um, I'm curious, you know, Ar Arkasha, back to your like AFI grad film, you're talking about um body autonomy in a way and femininity and and i'm curious you know you've you've talked about how there's themes in this of repressed intuition and and sean and i the word was gaslighting that we came you know to after the film um there's uh, there's obviously themes of sexual assault which like sean and i were talking before immaculate conception by nature is like rape and sexual assault i'm really curious like what specifically arkasha for you drew you to um, this being a story you wanted to tell about Margaret and and what she's experiencing. Yeah, yeah, actually, you know, it's really interesting is that um, we both read the script at the same time. And after we read it, I said to him, um, what what was the scariest moment for you? And And you pointed out the scene when she's dancing on the dance floor at the disco, and then she wakes up the next morning and tells mm -hmm. what happened in between those two scenes you know, that's the scariest thing for me. And I think between that and this idea that I think if you're going to make a prequel to The Omen, you have to answer where Damien came from. So you're naturally talking about birth. Yeah. Um, and so I think altogether, knowing that if we were telling the story, we were really telling the story about female body autonomy and forced reproduction and and sexual assault and um, and how women's women are trained from such a young age to not trust their own intuition and to have their sense of self really destabilized so that their bodies can really be taken advantage of in such a horrific way. Um, I mean, it was also just really eerie timing. We pitched this take um, the day that uh, the six week ban was passed in Texas. Wow. Yeah. So wow. it was, I think it was just the river was flowing in that direction, no matter what. Um, yeah. What about you? Yeah. It's really interesting too. Cause you know, we've been working together for like eight years, uh, ever since Kasha, you know, graduated from AFI and, and made vessels. So I know, you know, we talk a lot about the, the films we grew up on and, you know, how Kasha, you know, loves these movies, but they're oftentimes missing a genuine female point of view and that mm -hmm. sensitivity and that experience. So, so many of the projects that have been really important to us and that Kasha really wanted to bring to the screen have, have centered around that theme. So it felt like we kind of had essentially eight years of development and practice and passion towards these ideas. And then we got the script and we saw that it was through Margaret's point of view. We Our take on it was we just wanted to kind of reconceive all the horror through female body horror, through this idea of you know autonomy over your body and yourself. I think one of the scariest things to us is losing your sense of self and losing autonomy of your body through kind of a constructed reality, you know, somebody having control over your experience. Um, so yeah, those were all really important to us. And from the very beginning, you know, we pitched that idea because that was just scariest to us and felt most appropriate to the time we're in, kind of spoke to the horrors that we see in our everyday life right now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I am curious. It seemed like, you know, one of obviously a lot of great things about this film, but Nell specifically is just so great as Margaret. And I think really owns all of the, all of those experiences feel so real. I'm curious what she brought to the table from your point of view, like what all she added to that character, even some of just like the solo the you, you talking about her waking up after the night, um, you know, the night out and she blacks out and doesn't know what happened. Like that specific shot, even though it's pretty static is like one of the most beautiful, but also kind of jarring shots I've seen at least in the past couple of months. Um, so I'm really curious, like what all she was bringing to the table with that character. Yeah. Well, real quick to that point, the, in the screenings that we've been in, the biggest reaction out of everything with the exception of the vagina um, <laughs> is this moment when she's dancing and then we cut to black Mm -hmm. And for some reason, cutting to black, everybody like goes like, <gasps> mm -hmm. and then she, when you see her wake up, everybody goes <gasps> again. And it's it's really interesting that these like moments, what she did for the character, I think, made these mo moments that you wouldn't expect horrifying on the mm -hmm. page, even though you nailed it right away. Um, and she brought such this amazing humanity to this character because I think she goes through so much and 
by the end of the film, we're physically tearing her up. And I think in order to do that ethically, you really have to invest the time and, and patience into getting to know who she is and see her complexities as a person. And Nell was able to bring all of that dimension right away, but also it's a movie about losing control over your body. And she brought a physicality um, that is sometimes so subtle and endearing. Like when she, she like trips in the hall in the orphanage and then immediately gets very bashful, you know? And I thought there was something so sweet and endearing about that, but then all the way to the possession homage where she is able to tell this story of losing her, you know, sense of self and her body to this, this horrible force. Um, was was so I mean she blew us all away it was insane yeah, yeah. and like you know it's it's a 40 some uh, day shoot and you know she's in every single day yeah. you know apart from just the talent and like Kasha said kind of how she, she humanized the character there's just an extraordinary amount of stamina it takes because it's such a physical performance at times and it's a really emotionally draining one so just the stamina and kind of being in it and she was very much a leader for the rest of the cast and kind of forced everybody to elevate their games like she's she's incredible and she's just a really kind person which you don't yeah. have to be uh but she's so nice um so yeah we were super super lucky and really the the film rests on her shoulders so you know mm -hmm. she didn't bring it the way she did you know we would have been in a lot of trouble but she's amazing yeah there there is actually this kind of amazing moment um where we this this moment actually ended up getting cut from the scene but she's like she's laying on the ground at the end of the film in the sand and the dirt and her stomach has been ripped open and it's um, like our fifth day filming in that oh, place. Yeah. yeah and it was such a, a very disorienting place to shoot because it's this big dome you know so you, you talk at one end and you the person you're talking to can't hear you but the person right. across the room can hear you right. so you just you got to be really careful what you say and and right. like, all the wrong people are getting your direction it's just <laughs> like yeah it was very strange. Um, so she's on the ground. We're losing time. We might not make our day, which is also very terrifying. And I hate having, you know, lovely, wonderful Nell laying on the ground. And so I ran over to her and I said, no, please just give me two seconds. I'm so sorry. I, I have to figure out this problem and I don't know the answer yet. And she grabbed me and she goes, we have to figure out this problem. And right when she said that, one of the SFX guys was testing the propane level on a flame behind her. And it went, <laughs> and it was just like this. She was just this like fire goddess, you know? And I was just like, who are you? You were so <laughs> to help me make this movie. It was so cool. Oh, I need that BTS shot. I need yeah, that that's, in the, the yeah. Special that's features. promo material right there. Where's yeah. the, the marketing? Yeah. yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. I, yeah. Nell absolutely kills it. The, the, you guys obviously were talking about all the the stamina needed and the range, you know, that her character goes through. Also, I just vulnerability. I would imagine uh, to to do a lot of you know everything in the in the movie just yeah blew us away. Um, sorry about bouncing all over, but uh, we're we're <laughs> we're you know I we're gonna work our way up to the shot specifically, but um, but. I, I'm curious about some of the lore stuff, some of the the slight changes. Again, I'm not an, an absolute omen expert, but I did recently rewatch the trilogy uh, after some time. I'm curious about it. Like, it, it seems like in the original franchise, you know, Satan is supposed to have impregnated a jackal, and you guys kind of play with that a bit. And you find, you know, in in the original uh, movie, they find the the canine corpse in the grave that's supposed to be Damien's mother. I'm just curious if you guys could elaborate at all on on changes like that, or how you guys might see the those movies now with your movie being canon in that timeline. Does that make sense? I'm I'm trying to figure out how to best word it. Totally yeah, makes absolutely, sense. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. I'm really excited to talk about it because we haven't really Perfect. to talk about it. Yes. Uh, right. Because it is like we obviously there's such a, a rooted mythology when it comes to the jackal and what happens to it. And, um, mm -hmm. and so I think what we were excited about that, but really wanted to approach it in kind of a, a subtly different way. You know, I think one of the things we were talking a lot about, like, okay, what would create something so horrific to where the antichrist could be born? And I mean, this is such a awful conversation to be having, but we were like, Oh, incest is, one of the most disgraceful, horrible things. And so of course the antichrist would have to be born from incest. And we're kind of working backwards to how do you, how do you have this jackal, this 
Yeah, like the Omen franchise is a hugely masculine franchise. You know, it's like yeah. super we got Sam Neill, like it's Gregory Peck. We got these, you know, and it's always told through these male perspectives. And so for for me, it made sense. I don't know why, but it was just like the Jackal was a man to me, you know, mm -hmm. he, um, and, and to have like this male bestial character was really exciting. And, and there's, you know, there's this, um, I don't know if you guys have read this book, women who run with wolves. Um, no, I've yeah, heard of it. Not. <laughs> yeah. It's well, I, I think, uh, it was recommended to me and it's, it's in a, a to be read section. Yeah. It's, I will get to it now. You're you're bumping it up, but oh yeah, sorry. no rush. It's yeah. um yeah, but I love that you have a to be read section. I have yeah. a to be read section too, and I love just staring at it all the time. Yeah. It's ridiculous. That's a yeah. whole other <laughs> great yeah. But there's this this um they talk about uh fe collective female nightmares like mm. kind of Joseph Campbell way, and this one nightmare that has been documented that women have all over the world is about this the animal groom. And it's this half man, half animal that women will wake up in the middle of the night and see this figure looming over them. And um, I was so in love with this idea. And then when we were talking about the jackal, it felt like there was this really interesting parallel there to have not just, you know, the jackal from the omen, but to have this figure that has haunted women's dreams throughout history. Um, but how do you do that and still have the mother be a jackal and to have this idea, this twist with incest and having Margaret essentially be half jackal kept us in, like we had one foot still in the, in the mythology, but got to explore it in this like very different way. Yeah. What would, yeah. yeah. It's, it's very similar to the, what we talked about with the Satanist versus the Catholic church. You know, we yeah. wanted to stay true to the mythology and, you know, in our eyes we do because Margaret is born of the jackal, you know, she is mm -hmm. part jackal. But we wanted it to be scary to us and speak to the themes of the film. So like Kasha said, to have Margaret be raped by the jackal just frankly is a more terrifying and disturbing prospect that very much speaks to the theme of the film. I think to kind of, again, have just the, the mom be a, a demonic creature um, just didn't scare us as much. So we wanted to kind of speak to the mythology, but kind of put this creative twist in our own way. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so many things. Loved it. It it makes me think of when I was rewatching, you know, the the movies recently, and I saw the the canine corpse in there. Now I have to ask. It to me, I was like, okay. So to make that make sense, what did the did the extremist cult put? I almost saw it as like a slight to Margaret. I was like, they put a dog in there as a reference to her, like almost like as an insult to her. But then I was like, or is that the actual carcass of the demon? I, I don't know. It, do you have like an answer for that or, or an idea of what of what you guys would see that being? I mean, personally, I love the idea that the corpse of this demon is still underneath this orphanage where all these little girls are being raised. Yes. And I that is terrifying and such a like insult to young women <laughs> growing up. Um, so that's I mean, my in my head, I always thought it was a, like a, um, what do you call this? Like a left turn. What is yeah. this? What's the word I'm trying to say? Mr. X. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 But the good thing is, is I think it genuinely can be left open to interpretation. I think what you said about it being a slight is, is really interesting. I think you can say that it's the jackal's bones. I think you can say Margaret is a descendant of a jackal and she has a pretty ferocious feral moment in this film. So that maybe, you know, She's not entirely human herself. So I think kind of leaving it open to interpretation, I think is a really nice way to, to leave it. Yeah. Okay. Love, All right. I, I just that. needed my canon Sean, answers. I yeah. was going to say, as long as Sean, <laughs> Sean can write this down in his fan fiction, that's literally yeah, all that matters. But I got it. It's not the I, fan uh, fiction. This is yeah. canon. <laughs> it's just an adventure, which is really nice. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, one thing we do have to bring up, uh, you know, as two straight white dudes that, that host a horror podcast we don't say the word vagina enough on this pod and so we need to talk about the nc-17 shot that was or, or could have been and you, you've talked about it at length uh in, in a number of different interviews about kind of the struggle of getting the shot in there which i think is uh, obviously such a very important shot a shot a very jarring shot a very effective shot i'm curious what you hope the lasting impact of this sort of decision is 
obviously it is a grand decision to have something like this in a film, probably more difficult to get this type of shot in a film than it would be for male genitalia or anything along those lines. And I'm curious what your hopes are for the future of this type of, um, I guess, diversity and shot selection in films. Well, you just did it. <laughs> Having uh, straight men say the word vagina yeah. casually <laughs> is like a huge goal for us. And it's, it was, um, yeah, it, it's interesting because uh, the, the word, the word almost, I think for a lot of men is taboo. So it's, yeah. it's been fun having people just be able to speak about female anatomy without using slang. It's really lovely. Um, but, you know, I think, man, this shot was, um, it was always, this is what we pitched really in our, in our initial pitch to the studio um, to do our take on this. And it's, it, um, there's so much in the film, you know, we have a lot of gore, we have a lot of body horror, we have a lot of blood. We have a jackal penis in the film. You do? Um, yeah. Yes. And uh, that did not flag <laughs> an NC-17 yeah. rating. With the relief, you seem to have said that without a question mark. So you didn't <laughs> see that. Those people don't. Oh, no. Oh, I was I was well, well aware. Yeah. Okay, right. guys were open for yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> my mom calls that the witch's hat. She didn't know what it was. And she said, oh, look at that witch's hat. And I was like, oh, God bless you. Yeah. That I've never heard that euphemism hard. before, but yeah, no, it's yeah, great. Hopefully that'll catch on with the kids. Yeah. 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 <laughs> kids love the demon hat. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's so funny because that none of that was a problem, you know, for the ratings board, it was really just the birthing clinic. And then when we got down, you know, it's a very like forbiddenly opaque uh, process. Like they don't tell you what it is that they find offensive. You just have to kind of guess. And yeah. eventually, you know, we went back and forth over five times and finally kind of got down to the bottom of it. And it was really just the frontal, the full frontal shot of the vagina. And um, the way we originally had it cut was it, it was um, just that frontal shot and you slowly see this hand emerge. And the problem that the ratings board had was with the section of the shot before the hand emerged. Mm -hmm. So for us, the horror is not the fact that you're seeing a vagina, it's what's happening to the female body. And for them, it was the vagina that was offensive, not what was happening to it. Um, which, which was really in, infuriating and enraging. And I think that, you know, it, it, I think it was a huge win to just get this scene on screen to begin with. Um, and to have Disney support you in that fight is absolutely surreal. Yeah. And a, like the little girl inside of me is just like beaming with joy. Um, but I think that like this, I'm hoping this is just the beginning of the fight. You know, I, I really want to be able to see the female body portrayed in a really non-sexual light. Like I think I grew up on slasher films and horror films and, and something was always very alienating to me, even though I love watching gore as a kid. And I think, you know, this might be like, sounds super pretentious, but I, I learned about pickerism not too long ago, you know, like, like getting sexual gratification through stabbing people rather mm. than through sex and all of a sudden um some of why this imagery felt very strange to me all of a sudden made sense you know yeah um so it was another way of sexualizing the body and so i i yeah. got really we both got really excited about the idea of, of being really bold with the thematics but also with not shying away from the imagery that came along with that and doing it in this like this a uh, different lens you know yeah, you have to be able to flip things on their head. And I think, you know, we know one thing and it's old white men, whether it's on ratings boards or the government or whatever, are afraid of uh, female anatomy. And that's just like, you know, Terrible. you are obviously such an impactful uh, and necessary, um, you know, voice in, in trying to change that. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can do whatever we can to help amplify that because uh, it's it's just ridiculous that we're like still in this in this place when um like the ratings boards have been treating the the female anatomy and things like this in films for so long. And we're still like, not, you know, we're evolved, but not that far down, which is uh kind of disconcerting, but, but still good that we're, we're growing obviously. For sure. And you know, it's, it's not, it's not all, all on the men. It's on the women too. You know, women, it's a, it's a mix of men and women on these boards. And I think that there is, 
even for women, a lot of fear about seeing the female body because we're not really taught a lot about our yeah. body. So there's a lot of mystery and fear about it. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate you saying that. Um, it, but it, it will be a group effort. Yes. 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 No, I, I, I hope so. And again, I, I couldn't be happier that, that, that you came to that conclusion that compare or, uh, compromises were made and, and that that shot exists in the film, um, for, for whatever reasons, uh, normally we end with mostly horror Rex. What I want to do really quick. I, I know we only got a couple minutes left with you. We end this film in a way that suggests that the story may continue. But obviously, you guys have talked about how you can't redo the omen. But it looks like there may be some story left to tell. What inkling can you give us? What just 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 I need just a tidbit. Is there anything you can give? We can't give much. All we can say is that you're right in thinking that it's very much left with the idea that there is a parallel track. Mm. You know, and and again, it's we have no interest in redoing the omen. Yeah. Uh, but we, you know, a parallel track, I think ideally you you end with a feeling of finality with their story, but also, you know, a hunger to know more and to see where it goes. And I think um, yeah, I think there's definitely a place it could go that kind of is alongside what we what we know in the 76 version. And honestly, you could do the parallel track. There's also a really interesting story if we continue to move backwards. I mean, the jackal is, I think, still a mystery. And I think the origins of the conspiracy in the church is is a mystery. And I think that that that's all. I have questions. Yeah, I do, too. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see. I'm excited to see whatever ends up happening. Obviously, nothing confirmed, but I appreciate those tidbits. <laughs> yeah. yeah, me too. And and I love seeing how it affects the already existing stuff. I, I love it. Very excited to see where you guys go. Um, yeah, we, we don't have much time with you left. Uh, we do want to really quickly see if we can get uh, something, a little something we call mostly horror recommendations. Maybe just a, a horror film from each of you that you guys feel like showing some special love today, whether it be from the past or, or something you did in research, any anything you got, what's on the mind? Death Game? Well, I have another, yeah, oh, you go you first and I'll go next, yeah. We just discovered Death Game, the original. Death Game. I don't know that I've seen it. Oh man, I'm very excited for you. It is uh, Sandra Locke and Colleen Camp and um, our editor, Bob Murawski, he, he um, has a re-releasing company and they re-released Death Game and <laughs> Um, and he introduced it to us and I am obsessed. Okay. Yes. I'm looking at the poster and I'm, I'm very curious. 77, 1977. Yes, it is. Yeah. Like, okay. Um, I don't know. It's, it's like, um, it, it's reminiscent of the Manson girls in a little, a little bit in the performances. It's, it's fantastic. That's cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. My recommendation is actually another, it's called Grindhouse Releasing and it's even more obscure. There's this film called Hollywood 90028. Oh, damn, that's a good one. So they just did a restoration of this film. So it's going to be playing in a you know DCP, but it's going to be physical release soon. It is unbelievable. And it presents is this kind of like sleazy exploitation film set in the 70s in the porn industry in Los Angeles. But it's actually kind of this art house film in a way. And I don't want to spoil anything, but it kind of captures the feeling of like alienation and like existential crisis, like working in the entertainment industry and kind of shows you how that can go dark in a hurry and go to some really, really twisted places. Um, I would definitely, definitely check that out. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's it sounds like plot. a double feature to me. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I love, we have the two read pile. Now we have even more on the two watch pile. Yeah. Um, guys, Akasha, Tim, thank you guys so much again for your time. We really appreciate it. Uh, excited to see whatever else is coming next. All right. Thank you guys so much for listening to our conversation with Arkasha Stevenson and Tim Smith. And thank you again to both Arkasha and Tim for chatting with us about the first omen and also the, the actual first omen and the other omens that came after it. Um, what we, you know, what time it is mostly horror recommendation time. Uh, we, I feel like I didn't have a lot of recs last week. I don't even remember what I 
recommended last week. Um, I know what I am going to recommend this week is actually a couple of things. Um, I've been watching, watching a couple of movies. Um, and I'm going to start with the film that I watched uh, last night. I watched this movie like once a year, probably. A24 just said, once a month now, we're going to show one of our old films in IMAX. And uh, this month, yesterday, it was Ex Machina. Next month, it's Hereditary, and the month following, it's Uncut Gems. So I had to go. Chelsea and I both went to uh, see Ex Machina remastered for IMAX. And I know I've talked at length about Alex Garland and how I love his films. But if you haven't watched Ex Machina in a while, get on that. Oscar Isaac is so good. Domino Gleason is great. Alicia Vikander is great. The the score, um, Jeff, what what are their names? Jeff Barrow and Ben Salisbury, the the composers that work with Alex Garland, like the Ex Machina score, the Annihilation score, the Devs score, they're all so good. And like the sound also in an IMAX theater is just like sure. in your brain. And so it was just amazing. The dance scene in Ex Machina is like probably one of the best scenes of all time ever. Um, when Domino Gleason says, you tore up her picture and Oscar Isaac says, I'm going to tear up this fucking dance floor, dude. Check it out. <laughs> 10 out of 10 would watch again is just an absolutely amazing movie. Um, one of my favorite films that deals with AI, one of my favorite films, like one of my favorite sci-fi films. It's, it's, it's so good. So um, Ex Machina definitely have to recommend. Also, nine years old now, which is crazy, yeah, and holy scary shit. and and sad. Um, a movie that's not nine years old and actually just came out a, a week or so ago is the new Rose Glass film, Love Lies Bleeding. Oh, uh, yeah. Rose Glass is the director of Saint Maud, the wonderful film um, with Morford Clark that came out twenty 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 one probably like yeah probably twenty twenty um. Love Lies Bleeding has uh, it stars Kristen Stewart and Katie O'Brien, who is um, kind of like new on the acting scene. She's in some small parts, but this is really her first leading role. Um, it's this like weird lesbian neo noir, or, like not lesbian, but like queer near neo noir thriller crime movie, and it just rules. It is really stylistic but also like not to where it's detracting from the film. It gets weird in the same sort of ways that St. Maud gets weird, like mm -hmm. where it's still really grounded in reality, but it's fucking weird. Um, and yeah, it just further emphasizes that Rose glass is just awesome. And Hell so yeah. um, I was very excited for this because I love St. Maud and, and yeah. uh, was, was very pleased. Um, there's also, uh an actress in this who's kind of comedic relief her name's um anna barishnikov is the actress's name and she is just like one of the best comedic relief characters i've i've seen in so long i was like dying and it's not like a comedy it's just she was so funny in it um so that's my second wreck and my third wreck we're going for three today okay. um i sydney and i were trying to find something to watch before going to bed a couple nights ago and couldn't figure anything out. And so I saw on Netflix just a, a doc and it said the volcano. And there was a subtitle and it says, uh, I, I actually won't even say what the subtitle is yet. I just saw something that said the volcano. I was like, I can watch a nature documentary right now before okay. falling asleep. Uh, basically, this story is in 2019 in New Zealand. Um, there is this volcano that's off the coast of New Zealand, about like an hour ferry ride from New Zealand. It's just this volcano on an island. Yeah. And like the volcano is just like the island is just the tip of the volcano. It, it goes, it's way bigger and it goes underground or underwater. But visitors can go to this island and see this active sulfuric spurting volcano. And essentially, as you can assume the documentary is about, in 2019, a bunch of people were on this island, and the volcano did an erupt. It did do an eruption. And it is uh, 
I think the doc's a little longer than it needs to be, but okay. it is emotional and it's fucking scary. Jesus. And it's like, it's just intense and uh, really well told story. Um, Sydney was like <laughs> nearly in tears watching it I when bet. we, she did not sign up for that. Um, so it's called the volcano rescue from Vakari W H A K A A R I. Um, but yeah, just a, a really tragic story, but also like a, a story about resiliency and, uh, yeah. So three good wrecks that I've watched within the past, like four days. Wow. That's okay. what I got for you. Um, a couple things. Lots on pack there. Yeah. I'm going to start with Rose Glass really quick. I've just heard. Rose gonna, Glass. I just can't ass. think of another way. <laughs> put it on a shirt um i can't think of another way to say it it's just this is just what i've seen on the internet it really seems like the gays are eating this movie up i've seen so much thirst online and yeah. it i'm i'm curious to see it there's a lot of hubbub well, you, you have kristen mm -hmm. stewart who is a lesbian icon yeah and you have katie o'brien who is mm -hmm. i don't know katie's sexuality as a person but is a body a legitimate bodybuilder ripped yeah. to shreds mm -hmm. um and it's you know the movies it's hot so it's hot i get it it's there hot. was the guy that was he fell asleep <laughs> jerking it in uh do you, oh, you saw yeah. that we talked about that right yeah, <laughs> yeah that was at sydney's hometown mjr that <laughs> happened <laughs> <laughs> We've talked uh, about that because it looks yeah, like a there's, friend. There's, yeah, there's more to <laughs> yeah. that. We'll leave that out. But <laughs> yeah, but the but okay. uh, yeah, dude, that, that, that movie, movie. Gotcha. it's got but it's got sauce. Steamy. It's just yeah, All it's right. it's. Great. I'll take it. Yeah. Um, also, speaking of Kristen Stewart, shout out to our guy Mike Scollins, who did. Uh, he he, I think he helped co-direct and and co-write the day drinking with Seth Meyers and Kristen Stewart. Great twenty ish minute youtube video if you guys are Hell yeah. looking for something else to watch four um, recommendations perfect i'm going to then bring up your volcano doc movie yes and use it to segue i'm gonna it's gonna a two-part segue so the first yeah. is one that you made a me two think of part segue yeah you'll see dude you'll I've see never heard of that I'm, I'm gonna use it as a segue for this and then i'm gonna pull it back and segue again you'll see all right um but basically, I didn't plan to talk about this one today, but you're talking about a volcano dock and it being scary and emotional and sad. And I just want to bring up the 1997 movie titled Volcano starring Tommy Lee Jones. Uh, <laughs> I might have said it on the pod before. This movie was on at specifically at my mom's house a good amount. I think my, my stepfather. It was one of his, like, you don't change the channel when Volcano is on. Uh, <laughs> it's literally <laughs> about a volcano opening up under, like, L.A. or something, or San Francisco. I don't remember where they are. Wow. Um, but under a major city. And it has some scary stuff. There are two scenes in that movie Los specifically. Angeles. Los Angeles. That's what I thought. Yeah. Uh, there are two scenes specifically in that movie that when I was a little kid, before I was, like, watching horror, uh, that would scare the fuck out of me. Um and yeah, just put this like deep fear of volcanoes into my head. Um, so like, you luckily got, we don't. You got Keith David and Don Cheadle in that movie. Oh yeah, there's yeah, it's a, it's a whole thing. Nice. But man, it's there is it is a scary flick, and if you haven't seen it, I would recommend everybody go check that out. It's an action movie, you know, it's a total night like late nineties action flick. Yeah. But it has some real moments of horror in it. Um that that are pretty intense and that have haunted me for my entire life uh then boom segue again you talk you brought up a doc it's i just have to recommend that if you have not watched quiet on set um you know the mm. dark side of kids tv the nickelodeon doc i don't think we've talked about that yet yeah obviously everyone has everyone's talking about it i'm sure that i am not your intro uh to this docuseries that they've done but if you have not watched it yet, highly recommend it. It is fucked. It is a perfect way to further ruin your childhood. Um, turns out that not only does everything suck now, but it always sucked and you didn't know it. Um, so yeah. definitely really intense um, and a lot, a ton to unpack. And uh, it's weird. I have like this weird after watching it. I want to go back and rewatch some Nickelodeon shows and just like see just how fucking weird stuff is through like through a an adult lens and be uh, a post this documentary lens um and i guess two more um the other one is i might have talked about her on the show before 
but I don't think I've ever officially uh, recommended her stuff in this segment. And I also think it's been a long time, but there is an artist named Rachel Chinauri and she released an, an album a few years ago. I think it was like during COVID, at least when I found mm. her um, called four degrees in winter. And I absolutely love that album. I recently rediscovered it uh, and have been going on a kick of that again. Um, it's very, I don't know how to describe her sound, but like ethereal and like dark and, and just like, I don't know. It's very atmospheric. It, she has such a unique sound that I can't really compare to anybody else. Uh, and she has some new singles that she's been releasing. Um, All I Ever Asked, uh, Never Need Me, and So My Darling. They're a bit more on the poppier side. It, it's kind of different. But even then, it's still very unique. So I'd be curious to see what uh, what you and anybody else thought of her music. Both specifically that album. I love Four Degrees in Winter. I pre-ordered it on vinyl and waited months to get it. Uh, after I had found it. And I'm really liking the the kind of new direction she's going that is still very much her. So big thumbs up to Rachel. And lastly, uh, you know, it, with the theme of the episode, I, I've seen The Omen a lot of times in my life, mm-hmm. um, but it had been a while. And I had never seen the third one all the way through. And it had been years and years and years since I had seen the second. So prepping for this episode, rewatching that trilogy, I still haven't seen the fourth one, but but rewatching that original trilogy specifically about Damien's arc was really fun. I had a lot of fun and the Omen two has some great kills in it. So if you haven't, if you haven't seen them or if it's been a while, re reopen, reopen those DVDs or VHSs or whatever you got, find a streaming. Go and if you've it. seen the fourth one, tell us what you think. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. watch that soon. I, yeah. uh, I didn't, I only knew about the first three. I had never heard about the fourth until prepping for this interview. So it, yeah. uh, was under the radar for me for sure straight to straight to tv i think on that note that's a great way to wrap it so if you've seen the fourth omen uh omen ivy uh send us a email mostly horror movie night at gmail.com if you've seen the first omen and also the movie the first omen that just came out um send us a instagram message at mostly horror pod we're on tiktok and twitter at mostly horror I'm everywhere at Steven is Average. Sean's on all the socials at Hypocrite Inc. or Hypocrite.inc. And that's all we got for you this week. We'll catch you next time. Goodbye.